Well, it's obvious that I'm talking to you and yeah, you're not the camera, so it yeah. yeah. It doesn't have to be. All right. Yeah. Let's do it. Yeah. All right. So, can you please say your name for the camera? Thomas Shirley. Thomas Shirley. And can you tell us how old you are? So, I'm 44 years old. When, when were you born? Can you just give us a little bit of context about the year you were born and kind of the month you were born? Yeah, so I was born in July of 1977 in Pahokee, Florida. That's uh, just north of, the, of Lake Okeechobee in southern Florida. The Big Lake, kind of sort of basically right in the middle between Miami and like the um, uh, Fort Lauderdale area, just north of the Everglades National Forest. Okay. When did you have your first job? My first official like W-2 job was um, Wendy's and I was 15 years old and it um, took a minute for me to get it together but once I did I did pretty well with that. Before that I did, I you know got different odd jobs. One time I worked for a guy putting up uh, office modular furniture for like office buildings so everyone can have their little cubicle. Um, did like some random cleaning and stuff like that. Worked for a little business my mom worked for for a while just kind of organizing and I would have been 14, something like that maybe. In total, how many careers would you say you've had uh, just off the top of your head? So when you say careers, I'm thinking like something that's long term that you're trying to get really good at so that you can make something work out of it. Dozens and dozens of jobs. I've never actually taken the time to try to count what they are. Uh, I've never really found, I found one thing that I really enjoy doing um, that I did for quite a number of years. Um, but as far as uh, like actual things that I really committed serious time to, um, I had a remodeling business and uh, painted houses. The painting was probably the largest part of it and have done that off and on over the years. I've had seasons where I would do that for extended periods of time and then seasons where it would just be something that I would step into or step out of depending on the need or the opportunity. Uh, most recently, about the last year and a half, I've been in the restaurant industry as a server and uh, working toward bartending. As far as the thing that I really enjoy, that I've really spent a good bit of time in, I really enjoy counseling, um, helping people deal with traumatic issues and find the issues in their own hearts and minds that are kind of stunting their growth or hindering them or self-sabotaging patterns in their life. You say you were in counseling, but we've also talked before, you said that you were also a bus driver for a period of time. I was. Talk, and so let's talk about you being a bus driver. What was one of the most, probably the most memorable things you remember <laughs> as being a bus driver? Well, so I, I drove a, a church bus in Central Florida for a few years, off and on. Um, but when our family moved to northern Indiana to go to Bible college, uh, ended up working for a Christian school, driving a bus in uh, basically downtown Chicago. One of the things that really stands out, I remember, I, for some reason I actually thought about this yesterday. Um, I remember opening the door to let a kid off. I was in full stop, had the stop signs on, the flashers, everything was on. Opening the door to let this kid out and it was a one-way road. But apparently there was just enough room on the right side of me for a vehicle to squeeze through there. Mm -hmm. And this kid was stepping off of the bus and a cop car just cut right around me. Didn't have his flashers on, wasn't an emergency, but just cut right past the bus. And I literally had to grab the kid's backpack and pull him back into the bus. Otherwise he would have gotten hit by a cop car that was illegally passing me in full bus stop mode. Probably the other most memorable thing is my boss was just an absolute d he was literally the most unkind, worst boss I've ever had. Like he still to this day takes the cake. But I had some fun memories with the kids. Uh, a lot of laughs with a handful of them. We got kind of close to some of them. It was it was an interesting job experience. Something that I don't like to talk about because at the same time that it was interesting and somewhat fun, it was pretty traumatic. My schedule was insane. I had to pull off the bus lot at five o'clock in the morning, and um, had to have the kids back to school by eight or eight thirty. <clears throat> And then I would go to school during the day, and then I would come back in the afternoon. I believe that I had to be back about 3.30, 3.45, and then take the kids back into Chicago. The traffic was insane. So in the mornings, it would be anywhere from a three to four hour run. In the afternoons, it would be anywhere from four to seven or eight hours, just depending on if there were, tra if there were traffic accidents, snow, things like that. So that was extremely difficult for me to, to deal with, but I made it through, I'm still alive. You said that, that would be the worst boss you ever had. What do you think the best boss you would be? I'd have to say probably one of the best bosses I've ever had is a guy named Todd Henson. Um, he hired me to work at a Save-A-Lot grocery store in Hammond, Indiana. 
and hired me in the meat department to be a meat cutter. I had no experience, trained me, and within, I wanna say, six months or so, I was actually managing the meat department. And uh, Todd was probably the best leader that I've ever actually worked for in a job situation. He was very level-headed, very generous, very kind, wasn't afraid to get in my face, which he did many times. He you know, had no problem dropping the hammer, but he was, he was an excellent boss, very enjoyable to work with. Good, good man, good man. So you, you've been a bus driver, you've been, uh, you've worked at a grocery store as a meat cutter, um, you've also worked as a server, you've worked with family before. Um, out of everything you've done, you mentioned earlier the thing you're really most passionate about is counseling. So go into a, a little bit on that. How long were you a counselor? I mean, technically, if you're going to look at it, I would say I was pro probably been in counseling for about 20, 22 years. Uh, solid 17 years of that was in a very uh, right wing, fundamentalist, legalistic, Christian uh, setting. Mm -hmm. And um, I basically was a pastor, not always in the sense of being the guy that would stand in the pulpit every Sunday and deliver a message, although I did a lot of that. Um, but in the sense of being a shepherd, being someone that was always trying to bring people to a better understanding of themselves and like the way that they needed to go, of course, for those many years, it was trying to get them to line up with my philosophy concerning the Christianity that we were in. <clears throat> but at a certain point, uh, that really began to shift. I was about 30 years old. I had been looking for help for many years, uh, severe mental issues, severe uh, bipolar, uh, lots of anger, lots of extreme depression, negativity, dominated my life. Uh, hurt my wife, hurt my kids, hurt just about everyone around me. Always trying to be there to help other people, but never really understanding how to help myself as much as I wanted to. And when I was 30 years old, I uh, reached out to a man that um, invited me to come spend some time with him uh, at his church. And uh, our family went there for a weekend and I got some real help for the first time. Like I really stepped away from this meeting with this man, having for the first time uh, that I could remember in my life, really finding some level of peace that um, I couldn't explain. So I had this meeting with this man and within six weeks, our family had actually moved to the area because we knew we weren't gonna get anything that we needed from where we had been. So we moved to this new place. We were in uh, Northern Indiana, Hammond, Hammond Gary, Indiana area. And we moved from there to Fort Dodge, Iowa. And um, I guess within about the first month of being there, I started meeting with a different man in the church that was extremely good with helping people get to hidden issues of the heart, like things that are, uh, through arrested development that you kind of lock away. I was led to uh, go spend some time with this man. And uh, as I did that, as he spent time ministering to me and helping me uh, find out some of the things that were going on in me, uh, within me, I finally got some, some like genuinely powerful healing. And I started to really flow in a, a completely different type of an anointing. And um, all of a sudden people from the church, people from around the country that knew me, people that had been in Hammond in particular that knew me, uh, they, started, they started talking to me, they started coming to see me. And um, we ended up having, I think, seven families that we knew personally moved to the area as a result of what had happened to me. While I was getting this extremely powerful counseling from this man, while I was getting like very intimate internal healing through the ministry of this man, doors began to open all over the place for me to help other people as they were dealing with their own issues. Um, remarkably, within two to three sessions with almost anybody that I would meet with for just an hour or two at a time, they would walk away with tremendous levels of freedom. They, you know, it was a really powerful experience for me. So you say that you had a lot of experiences helping different people and stuff like that and that you were really able to help them experience certain levels of freedom or release maybe from what they were experiencing or some of the biases that they had had in their life. Can you illustrate with the story without revealing anything about anyone personally? Can you reveal, can you give us a, like an example? Just maybe a kind of a simple example, something that for some reason has always stuck out in my mind, uh, even though it wasn't as deep and maybe traumatic as a lot of the people that I worked with or even my own experiences and the things that were revealed for me. During the process of being in Iowa, I ended up being an administrator of a home for troubled teens, basically. 
And one of the things that I did right off the bat is I required the parents to bring their kid with them so that I could spend time with the parents and the child because that would help me kind of get a feel for what was going on in, in their relationship. Because anytime you have a child that's got serious issues, it's probably about 99% going to be traced back to a hundred percent of what the parents have done, how they've acted, how they've operated in their lives. And I remember this one boy and his mom, and I don't remember her name. I, I don't know if I would recognize her if I saw her. The mom was incredibly sweet, and I would spend several hours with the parents when they would come, just alone without the kid there, and with the kid without the parents, so that I could get a more complete story without that pressure. But I remember this woman, I went into prayer with her, and trying to help her find what some of the lies were that she might be believing because she just was depressed, she was frustrated. And she was a beautiful woman. I mean, she's just, you looked at her and you're like, wow, she's very beautiful. But at a certain point, she broke down and started weeping. And I remember having to give her several minutes to do that, to just kind of get that out of her system. And I asked her, I said, what is it that you're struggling with the most? And she said, I don't look like the women on the magazines at the grocery store. And for her, that sound, might sound silly to a lot of people, although there are many women that struggle with that. For her, that was something that she struggled with. She thought she was ugly and that she didn't have any physical beauty as a result of looking at these models on these magazines that are not only make up and paint brushed and then the finishing touches when they go through editing to put it out there. Um, she got a lot of freedom that weekend. As I talked to her after that, she really began to come into a lot of joy. She had a lot of laughter and uh, she left very happy. So that's just one uh, very simple example of something that I've seen happen for someone. That's a really, that's a really good story. So, so out of your 20 something years of counseling, um, what would you say is the biggest lesson that you've learned through all the people that you've dealt with and through all of the experiences that you've had with them and not only that, all the things that you've learned, you know, the education that you received in the process and those, those experiences, what do you think is the biggest lesson that you've learned and what advice, like what is the biggest piece of advice that is something that you would share with like the people watching this video right now? Sure. Um, a lot of teachers will use the phrase, you've got to learn to love yourself. And, and that's a truthful statement. It's because we come into contact with belief systems. You know, we're born into a world system that limits us. I mean, through television, through the radio, through things we read, through school, through our parents, through friends, through whatever. I mean, it's just, it bombards us from every side. And as a result of that, we lose sight of who we really are. The phrase, uh, the term inner being is a term that's used quite a bit. Uh, the term that I've been given a number of years ago is the actual self, who you actually are. And that person is at conception. That's a unique reality that is uh, unlike anything that most of us ever get to experience because it gets covered up by layers of experiences and beliefs and lies and you know ideas and, and um, um, paradigms that we view life through, view ourselves through. All people that struggle emotionally, mentally, they all have belief systems in place that hide from them who they truly are. I'm a loser, I'm a failure, I'm stupid, I'm fat, I'm ugly, I'm unloved, I'm unwanted, I'm, I'm never gonna get anywhere in life, I'm always gonna suffer, I'm always gonna be alone, I'm never, you know, all these different things and there's dozens more that people go through all of those are belief systems that are based on our five sensory, three-dimensional world that we live in. A lot of people do affirmations or declarations where they'll write things down about themselves that they want to be true, but they don't believe are true, and they'll begin to repeat those things and try to get those things to become true for them, trying to make themselves believe something that for most of their lives has been unbelievable to them. For many years, people would tell me how valuable I was and it would enrage me. Like, I'm not, I'm not valuable. I'm worthless, you know, I'm, I'm no good. I'm a bad person. That was belief systems that were, that were dominating my life, dominating the decisions that I made, dominating my relationships. But I've con gone through seasons where all of that illusion, if you will, or a smoke screen, if you will, was removed, it would fade away, and I would actually get to see who I really am independent of 
the experiences that I've had. The greatest advice I can give to anyone is to really begin to seek out who you truly are. Who were you at conception? What, what was that unique signature expression that you are? Just like a thumbprint or a footprint or a retinal print, uh, those things are, that, that expression is uniquely who you are and what you are. And it might sound kind of weird, maybe hippy dippy or, you know, spoofle dust or whatever. But the truth of the matter is it's who you truly are inside. That's the person that you need to find because the moment you find that person, the moment that that person becomes uh, the, the, the focus of your attention and you actually get that glimpse, you get that experience with yourself as you are without all of the stuff that's been built on over the years, there's no trying to love yourself. And I tried for years to love myself, but all that I saw was the mess that I was, so it was a rather unlovely thing. But the times that I've gotten glimpses of who I truly am, it's only pure love. I encourage everyone because that's the place you really need to start from. Well, thank you so much for, for sharing all that, and thank you so much for your time. Um, is there anything else that you'd like to say before I wrap it up? I'm uh, thankful for the opportunity to, to get on here and share a little bit about myself, and I'm super excited to see this video on YouTube, on Clayfield. On Clayfield. Awesome. All right. I'm going to cut. Okay. I'm going to cut.